that time. As I've mentioned several times, my name is Bill Gibbs. I work on the Capitol staff, although I work remotely. I'm based in Austin, Texas, and of course the campus is in Laurel, Maryland. And it is just a delight to have each of you join us today. Now, in a little bit, we're going to be talking about uh, a 360 degree approach to executing, executing a vulnerability management program. And say that three times fast, and maybe you'll do better than I just did. It'll be presented by Dr. Dennis Beatty, and I'm just so pleased to have him join us today. Now, let's talk about the agenda that we'll be following. And by the way, this session is being recorded. We have found that many people enjoy watching this on demand or re-watching it on demand. And uh, at, toward the end of the presentation, we'll talk about how to get a copy of the recording. Now, it, here's the agenda. First, we're going to talk just very, very briefly about Capital Technology University. I know that many of you are quite familiar with it. I see faculty members. I see students. I see alumni uh, who have all joined us. But uh, for those, uh, for that few people that may not be that familiar with our organization, I wanted to go ahead and talk about them very briefly. Then I'll give some session pointers, housekeeping, if it, as you, um, just to cover it very briefly. Uh, then we'll introduce the presenter and then the rest of the uh, afternoon is his. We'll be uh, uh, talking about um, his presentation at uh, Toward the end of the presentation, we'll give him the opportunity to answer questions that you post in the text chat from the floor. And by the way, you can post the questions at any time. You do not need to wait till the end of the presentation. You can post them anytime. I'll be monitoring that and give you the opportunity to uh, uh, give the presenter an opportunity to respond to your questions. Then uh, after that, right to, uh, near the end of the hour, uh, I will uh, be talking about our upcoming webinars and then uh, talk about how to get a copy of the recording, a copy of the slides, and a certificate of completion if you desire one. Let's just talk very, very briefly about capital. And again, uh, many of you are very familiar with our organization, so I don't want to spend a great deal of time on this, but I do want to make sure that you know a little bit about us. Um, there are really just a handful of facts that I'd really like to cover today. Capital is a nonprofit, private accredited university lo located in Laurel, Maryland and established in 1927. Let's dissect that just a little bit. Nonprofit, that means our focus is on our students and uh, not owners or shareholders. Uh, we are private. That means we have a nimbleness and a responsiveness that public universities just aren't able to have be because of uh, their public nature. Uh, we are accredited. We actually have regional accreditation from the Middle States Commission, which is the highest level of accreditation available to any college or university in the United States. Uh, and we're authorized by the state of Maryland to confer degrees all the way from associates or two-year degrees right up to doctoral degrees. Uh, we've been around for a long, long time, since 1927. And I like, like to say this, it's fairly obvious, but I like to talk about it. Technology is literally our middle name, Capital Technology University. We are a STEM-based university focusing in on all things technological. And this presentation today is very much in keeping with uh, what we're going to, uh, who we are all about. And that's one reason I'm so very pleased to have Dr. Beatty join us today. Now, here's a little bit of housekeeping. We'll answer questions at the conclusion of the presentation, but post them at any time, and we'll take just as many as we can. We, are, we pledge to finish in 60 minutes, so we may not get to every single question, but we'll answer just as many as we possibly can. We're not activating microphones or webcams for participants today, so the way that we want you to communicate with us is through the text chat. We'll be sending a link to the recording and a copy of the slides to everybody who's registered today. And we'll also make it available on our website uh, probably on Monday or Tuesday. Finally, uh, when we send out a link to the recording, we'll also invite you to request a participation or completion certificate. Those are available on request to both those watching the live session right now and also those who join us on demand. 
Now with that, I'm just very, very pleased to be done with all the housekeeping and talk a little bit about our presenter and then let him get right into the slides. Our presenter today is Dr. Dennis Beatty. Dr. Dennis uh, Beatty is the Activity Chief Information Officer and Chief of Cyber Operations and Security for the Supervisor of Shipbuilding, Conversion and Repair in Newport News, Virginia. Uh, and um, subshipping is a joint operation between the US Navy and Huntington Ingalls Industries. The organization designs and constructs nuclear sub power submarines and aircraft carriers, as well as repair and modernize, modernize existing subs and carriers for the US Navy fleet. In his role, Beatty oversees cybersecurity, information technology, and traditional security programs. He's a 20 year retired veteran of the US Navy. He holds a BS in computer science and an MS in information technology from the University of Maryland University College and a doctor of science in information assurance uh, from Capital Technology University. And I might add that uh, information assurance is now called cybersecurity by the university. Welcome, Dr. Beatty. We are honored to have you join us today and I give you control. Oh, thank you very much for that introduction. Way too kind. Uh, I do appreciate that. Uh, we'll go ahead and get rolling here. So what we're going to do, we're going to discuss a 360 degree approach to executing a vulnerability management program. Now, while we like to think about vulnerability management in the workplace, an area I'd like to, you to consider is your homes. You know, how well are your homes protected? How well are your phones protected? How well are your home computers protected? So while we're going to focus on a few things in the workplace, I'd like you to consider this for your homes as well. And as you go about your daily businesses. So what we're going to discuss is, is, you know, why is vulnerability management important? What is the process of vulnerability management? What doesn't work and why? What works and why? You know, how do we get that management buy-in? Seems like when we try to do something with security and locking down infrastructure, locking down networks and protecting assets, we have problems occasionally getting that management buy-in. So we're gonna discuss some of those things that we can use to work. Some best practices that work and personal thoughts. Now, mind you, personal thoughts, I'm not really gonna discuss right now because that's more for, gonna be for your consideration when we get to the end of our presentation. So why is vulnerability management important? Now, I looked at the list of personnel that are attending today, and thank you to everyone for taking your time today. Uh, but one thing I would like to share with you is hackers do not care about us, what we do, what we do on a daily basis, where we are, where we work, but they want to get to us. They want our information. They want our resources. They want access to our technology. They want access to your banking accounts. They want access to anything and everything that they can get their hands on that can be used against us. So hackers attack us every 39 seconds. For those of you who are really wondering what that stands for, imagine sitting in your house and 108, to 108 times an hour, a hacker is trying to access your information. The average cost of a data breach in 2017 was $3.62 million. Now, while some of you may have that kind of money sitting around, personally, I don't have that kind of money sitting around. There are small businesses that don't have that type of money sitting around. So as you can imagine, a friend of mine shared last night that a nonprofit was hacked that had an operating budget of roughly $3 million, and they lost $175,000 in funding for the simple fact that somebody clicked on something they shouldn't have. So while $3.62 million may be, not be a large sum for our multi-trillion dollar organizations out there, for our small businesses and some of our banking accounts, $3.62 million is a lot of money. And an eye-opener for those of you not familiar with what we do in the cyber and IT world, or those of you that are, and some of you may have stories that you, you would like to share in, in, in another arena, some companies take up to six months to detect a cyber breach. So what I would like to correlate that to is if you are in your home right now or you are in your, in your office right now, open up your door, open up your garage, and just let somebody run in and out of your house nonstop for six months. That is the equivalent of having, having a vulnerability open in your network or a vulnerability open in one of your computers or one of your phones or any additional piece of technology. So 
This is why vulnerability management is important because you need to have all of those potential mechanisms for an, a hacker or anyone else or even the insider threat for getting inside of your house. You need to be aware of what's in place. And six months is a really long time to have your front door open, uh, especially because if people can run in and out of your house the entire time while you're there, they can do a lot of damage to your, to, to your business, your homes, and, and other organizations. So let's discuss the vulnerability management process. First, we have a delay. Sorry about that, people. Okay, sorry about that, everyone. We're doing this in real time. Obviously, we're not pre-recorded here. So we're all the way back. There we go. One more. Okay, now we're back to the vulnerability management process. This is a live show, ladies and gentlemen. This was not pre-recorded or rehearsed. So the first thing you need to do is validate what you have. So let's run a parallel with the home environment. You have to have an idea of what's connected to your home network. For example, which, which iPhones, which mobile mechanisms, which laptops, which, which devices are connected to your home router? Because keep in mind, once somebody's connected into your internal infrastructure, they can run around all of your technology without uh, thinking twice about it. And you may not even know they're there until again, up to six, potentially up to six months. For your organizations, you have to be aware of what assets are connecting to uh, your information systems. Uh, you, you, it's important to have an understanding of what exactly is connecting to your infrastructure within your organizations. And secondly, you have to prioritize uh, the, the protections that need to be with those mechanisms. For example, so let's consider a computer that protects the number of tennis balls available or the, the, the number of Thai restaurants within a given location. So what you want to do is you need to consider, do we really need to know the location of those Thai restaurants? Do those menus really need to be protected that much? Now, on the, on the other hand, you have accounting information for other organizations out there. Let's take financial backing. Let's look at banks, for example. So you, you don't want, you necessarily need that computer protected with the tennis ball counts and the Thai menus, but the financial ledgers of an organization you want to have, you want to have uh, assess the um, prioritize the risk of the protection on that. Additionally, you want to assess the risk of the vulnerability. What happens if you don't protect that computer, right? So if we lose count of tennis balls, I understand that tennis, tennis balls are important. However, they may not be as important as the financial ledger associated with protecting the, uh, the accounts on that information. So you want to assess the risk of what's going to be compromised on that and assess the level of, the, of risk that you're willing to accept with the vulnerabilities that are available. Now, mind you, people can, can like to confuse past patch management and vulnerability management. But for example, if you have an open port uh, on, on one of your switches or one of your routers, that's a vulnerability that not necessarily, you know, you have to get into, okay, what happens if, if I keep this port open? What happens if I, you know, don't you know, come close this out or move this to another location. The next step is fixing it. Got to remediate it. And if you can't remediate it, come up with a mitigation strategy for that. And once you get that remediation strategy in place, verify your remediation efforts. It is important that you validate your work because what you don't want to do is assume that you have completed your work. You have the accurate tennis ball count. You have the account ledgers locked down. The menus to the Thai restaurants are even protected. And you just all of a sudden, the next thing you know, everything is compromised. Your account ledgers are off base and, and you, you are not having any good luck there. So additionally, after that you've completed your remediation, report your updated security posture before and after to senior management. So one thing about senior leadership, and for those of you that aren't aware and have never engaged with senior management or executive management, they enjoy quantitative data. Where were we? Where are we? What is our next steps? So it is important to articul articulate the senior leadership and executive management, regardless of the organization, hey, here's where we are. If you are in your home, make sure that your family understands, hey, this is why we need to do, up, do those updates to our computers, uh, make sure our virus protection is updated, make sure that all of our technology is locked down. Make sure that you have those conversations when you're sitting around the dinner table and, and, and continue those. So what doesn't work and why? 
within organizations, if you do not have an established or, or if you don't have or follow a vulnerability management plan, you're wasting your time. If you have a vulnerability management plan in place and you aren't following it, you essentially drafted a document to check a block uh, to, for, for accreditation purposes. And that is not good for anyone. Uh, if you are in a senior management position and you have a vulnerability management plan in place, check with your check with your teams, check with your CIO, your CISO, and see how the, the how the vulnerability management execution plan is going. Patching during the workday. So uh, we've all been part of organizations, or if not, we have heard of organizations that where IT and cybersecurity are not considered a priority, and they don't want to approve alternate work hours. So what you really want to do is make sure that you are not patching during the workday and holding up progress. Because the last thing you want to do is stop production within an organization. Short notice and no notice maintenance windows. So right now, we, we, you know, we're in the 12 o'clock hour. We like to think that people are having lunch on a Friday afternoon. Uh, for those of you around the world, uh, thank you for joining. It is potentially in the middle of the night or it's early in the afternoon, uh, where, regardless of where you are in the world right now. So if somebody were to interrupt us right now and say, uh, Dr. Beatty, we need to stop the Zoom uh, session right now because we have to perform maintenance. That will be an abrupt interruption, which is not conducive to maintaining a good, a good vulnerability management plan. So we have to schedule those types of things. Uh, furthermore, if we don't communica communicate our security posture with senior management, we're not going to have the ability to provide senior management and executive leadership an accurate perception of where we stand across the board. So what we don't want to do uh, is, you know, what nobody really wants to do is say this. They don't want to be. You don't want somebody to think that we're in a good way as far as cybersecurity in reference to your network infrastructure and accountability of the assets, and as far as all other areas of security management as well. That all of your vulnerabilities are being addressed when they're really not. And the worst mistake that anyone can make in a vulnerability management program is pretending it will never happen to you. If you do, if you are in the in academia or you're working on your doctorate, which I did see a few students uh, sign up, pretending that it will never happen to you. There are so many people in, in the world that that personal customers, uh, businesses, organizations. The, only, the reason why they take cybersecurity serious and the reason why they have a vulnerability management plan is because it happened to them. So they're essentially taking a reactive approach, but it's a proactive approach in, in mitigating risks and remediating risks associated to their information. So now that we've discussed what, what doesn't work, we're going to discuss what does work. So scheduling maintenance and having leadership stakeholder buy-in. All right. Let's get leadership involved. Let's make sure that leadership understands what it is exactly that we're doing and why we need to get that maintenance schedule. Having a reoccurring maintenance schedule is going to prove invaluable. So, for example, if you have maintenance at nine o'clock on a Friday night, if you have a working the working level manager, so whether you whether you, you have uh, people within your organization that supervise two people, three people, one people, one person, five hundred people. A thousand people, whatever it is that you want to oversee, you want people to be able to plan. You want people to be able to have a, have a way to say, you know what, I can't plan maintenance from 9 p.m. Eastern Standard Time to 11 p.m. Eastern Standard Time because we're going to be doing maintenance during that time. Or they can schedule work around that time that is not going to require that uh, work to be done that impacts that maintenance window. So it gives leadership and it gives uh, organizations time to plan. What exactly, what, what ex when exactly that maintenance is going to be. Additionally, providing those reports to management. So we talked about not providing them is a bad idea. Let's provide those reports. Let's sit down and with those, that C-level leadership and with the, with the CEOs, the presidents of organizations, having those conversations and say, here's the maintenance that was not completed and what was not. And here's why. And have a path forward for going, for, for, for moving forward. So often we find ourselves in situations to where we have a problem without a recommended solution. So let's, you know, if, if we were not able to complete some of our maintenance, let's share why we were not able to complete it and let's do what we need to do to get that maintenance completed. Uh, timeliness is important in mitigation risk, is, is mitigating risk and remediating risk. Uh, there, nobody wants to wait that extra time uh, to get that done. And it's up to us to articulate the importance of that within the cyber IT realm. 
Additionally, communicating with end users those maintenance periods for work for for uh, for work planning purposes. As we discussed, we need to schedule that maintenance. We need to communicate with everyone. So we needed to communicate with the working level, the senior management. Hey, you're not going to be able to do work during that time. Maybe a user is more favorable to work work late at night from 9 p.m. to uh, 11 p.m. at night. After you know, if you're working from home and you're you're connecting via a VPN, and you know there's maintenance going on on the v, you know throughout the infrastructure. The kids are in bed, whatever. They're not going to be able to do that. They're not going to be able to access that information from 9 p.m. to 11 p.m. at night. So if you let your dogs out at two or three o'clock in the morning and they go running around outside, you're not going to want to be able to have to do that either. So you're not going to be able to work. So most likely, if that's the situation you're in, you probably want to retrain your dogs to go outside at one o'clock in the morning. So puppies will do that just for, so everybody's aware. Sending user email reminders saying their information system is powered on. So it is easy to just say, hey, you know what? You know, oh, the computer was off. I'm sorry. Well, if we're not reminding people and we, need, we can get those reminders out there and say, hey, the information system is powered on for, 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 for you know, patches to see what vulnerabilities are out there and remediating those patches. It's important that we do have a strategy and we communicate the importance of having our end users included. So our, and always, one, another piece I'd like to point out here is our adversary only has to be right once. Now, mind you, our adversary, it is important to say, well, those are people that want to do harm. No, those are people that want to do harm to you. They want to take your money. They want to take your resources. They want to get into your information and use it to do unwillful things. So please don't be confused and, and, and assume, as we discussed, that anyone is exempt from you know, having their information compromised regardless of vulnerabilities not being in place. And also, it, it, we don't necessarily need to be the popular people when we're executing a vulnerability management plan. Establish deadlines for that remediation strategy. Establish a plan for quarantining those vulnerable assets. You know, if you have a, a piece of your network, uh, you know, and, and with assets or a switch or a router that is not uh, necessarily in compliant or it's reached into life, you might have to per, uh, move it to a different virtual local area network if it's that important so you don't compromise your assets that are compliant. So keep that in mind. It's not necessarily always going to be a popular thing with vulnerability management. There are conversations that has to happen, and we are constantly assessing risk and find assessing risk with vulnerabilities. It's important to have a continuous dialogue with that. So how do we get management buy-in? So let's get on those calendars of the CEOs and the presidents. And for any of my fellow CIOs out there, do not be shy for having a conversation with your CEOs and presidents of the organizations and saying, you know what, this is great. You know, you're making a good amount of money here. We're, 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 we're in the black on our profit margins. But if we get hacked, we're going to get up in the red because a reputation will is detrimental and will cause, you know, a bad reputation and cause harm to the fi your financial bottom lines. So the last thing anybody wants to do is be caught up in, uh, in, in, in a hacking situation where information is being compromised, where you're potentially going to you know, impact your customers, your customer base, or compromise your sensitive information. Uh, you want to make sure that your stakeholders and you know, that's executive management, and that's senior management, that's the CEOs, they're aware of your network security posture. And if you are the CEO of your own company and, and you just so happen to have a cyber background, uh, you, you are a gold mine right now because you understand the importance. And I like to think that is already ingrained in your organizational culture. So furthermore, be consistent with your vulnerability management schedule. So what you want to do is, for example, we've been talking 9 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, 11 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Make sure that you have your schedule and you are consistent with your schedule. So that way management becomes uh, management understands, hey, from 9 p.m. Eastern Standard Time to 11 p.m. Eastern Standard Time on Friday night, we're not going to be able to access our infrastructure. And it is understood that we're not going to be able to do this. Whatever we have to do during that time, we're going to have to reschedule. So whatever you can need to do, you can plan around that. Furthermore, document your network security posture and document on a regular basis. So Let's not be shy about providing those reports up. As we know in some organizations, when, if, when, the IT, uh, when the IT systems get hacked or your systems get compromised or information gets stolen, 
The first people to get fired are the CISOs, your chief information officer, or your chief information security officer, or your chief information system security officer. Uh, for some of you, that may be your information system security manager. So provide that objective quality evidence about where you are so executive management is informed. In the event that you know, a vulnerability management plan is not in place and it is not successful, you have the ability to say, we provided this information to you. We told you that this is what happened. So if the, when the finger pointing begins, for those of us that have been, ever been involved in an incident, we know the finger pointing will begin. You have the ability to say, yes, but we, told, we got hacked, but we told you what the security was. We told you what the issues were. Here were the reports to where we provided you continuous feedback and continuous updates on where we were and how we were going about it. So best practices, and this is for, for any program, for regardless of what you are working on. There are a lot of process improvement programs out there. Uh, there are people in the quality improvement program out there, the Lean Six Sigma programs out there. There are a lot of different process improvements out there that are all about building different things and making them better. In order for you to get anywhere, and this says network security posture, but in order for you to get anywhere, address the, address the issue with senior leadership. Bring it up to those executive leadership people. Bring it up to everyone across the board. Uh, for example, if there is, you know, if there's some stuff that's going into life within fiscal year 22, bring that up now and get it built into the budget because you want to be able to br uh, bring up the question, answer the question of, well, why are we bringing this up now? It's now fiscal year 22. We didn't budget for this. So that could be anything. Plug and play the way you do it. And if there, there, there are different processes out there and you have concerns about your security posture or something's not going right in one of your programs, bring it up. Have the conversation and be honest about where you are in assessing your programs and tying it back, assessing your vulnerabilities within your organization. So regardless of whether you have maintenance or not, schedule that maintenance on a weekly basis. It's better to have that maintenance scheduled and not need it than to have to fight to get that maintenance scheduled. So if it's 9 p.m. if it's 9 p.m. on a Friday night, you know, people should assume that network maintenance is going to take place. So let's make sure that we're scheduling that network maintenance, whether we and, and, and have it on there, whether we need to use it or not. Because what we don't want to have to do is fight for time on that and fight for time to have the, to get that to, to get that maintenance completed. So if you finish up early, that's great. Uh, you send your send your notifications out. Say, hey, we're completing maintenance. Everything's back back up and fully restored. Communicate vulnerabilities remediated to senior management. So we talked about what works and why. Keep those open lines of communication going uh, with senior management so they're aware of what's been completed. Let's, uh, you know, keep ma senior management informed of, of you know, what, what was closed out, what vulnerabilities were handled. Uh, what, you know, did you have to move something to a virtual local area network? Did you have to quarantine parts of a network? Did you have to quarantine assets because the, 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 the vulnerabilities were not, were not taking place because they weren't online or proper updates didn't play, take place because they were online? Communicate with that because what, what will end up happening in a lot of cases is you're going to get trouble tickets or trouble calls, whatever your organization refers to them as, that you were not authorized to connect to the infrastructure, whether it's a network or a local area network, wide area network, because you, the, the, whatever vulnerability was not remediated. So be ready to have those conversations and provide that quantitative data of what was protected and what wasn't and what had to be disconnected from the infrastructure because it just didn't happen. It, 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 the vulnerabilities were not remediated. Furthermore, share those organizations the compromises because of improper vulnerability management. So there are, there are students on here that, that are, are doing a lot of great things with vulnerability management uh, within our cybersecurity portfolio. Uh, there's cybersecurity leadership going on. Uh, there's artificial intelligence going on. And there are also uh, uh, other pieces in there, your IT programs that are going on out there. Uh, so share the, the, those horror stories, as we like to refer to them as, that happen that have to happen with other organizations. So often we have we have compromises, for example, with financial industry within the Department of Defense. But there's other industries out there that that, that people like to compromise just to gain an advantage to make people uncomfortable. 
Uh, there's also uh, there's research out there on what happens to the power grid. Uh, a lot of SCADA research going on, research to do with SCADA and protecting SCADA. So share those organizational horror stories. It's important that those are out there so people understand that the it doesn't happen to me thought process. That's out there and it is very real. And furthermore, set the tone within your organization through your actions. It is important that as leadership within your organization, whether you are in the government, whether you support the government, whether you are in corporate America, whether you are part of a global economy, whether you are part of an organization in China, you, it is important that if you are in a leadership role, you set the tone of your vulnerability management program through your actions. That includes promoting, yes, I'm supporting the vulnerability management program, I have my computer connected and checking with your constituents and ensuring that they have their vulnerability management, connect, their, their assets connected and supporting, yes, we do have to go into quarantine because we do not have the ability to protect ourselves from what is coming down the pipe and protecting that information. But we still need to access that information and continue, uh, continue what we're doing. And here is wh where I would like to discuss personal thoughts. Um, this is for, again, this is for you to take with you. And this is for everyone on here. This is not cybersecurity specific. This is not home specific. This is not um, you know, information technology specific. This is just good leadership specific here. So think of an idea you wanna see implemented within your organization. We'll stop right there because it's easy to read on and say your organization's security posture. Think of an idea you want implemented within your organization. So my next question and my next challenge for you is, is management aware of your idea? Do they even know that this is something that you're thinking of that you put thought into? You know, maybe you've stared at the ceiling at the middle of the night or you woke up at three or four o'clock in the morning and, and, and thought about it. You know, this would be a really good idea. Um, is management aware of your idea? Have you had a conversation? You know, have you thrown stuff against the wall just to see if it would stick? Uh, because for all you know, you might have an idea that, I don't know, maybe you end up saying that $3.62 million that we were working about, there was an, uh, th th we were discussing earlier, you find out that the vulnerability or there's a piece where you can recoup that $3.62 million in another area, or you can reallocate resources from another piece of your program and hold on to that $3.62 million or recoup some of that. Before you ask that of your management, what are your barriers to implementation? Uh, are you your own barrier? Are you afraid to ask the question of yourself? Do you think that somebody's going to not want to hear what you have to say? Um, there, are the, there are a lot of great ideas out there that never get to the forefront because people self-impose their own barriers. There are a lot of fantastic leaders inside and outside of the cybersecurity field that self-impose their own barriers because they are afraid what people think. It takes a lot of courage to bring good ideas to the table. It takes a lot of courage to establish those barriers and have that conversation with management and say, hey, here's what I would like to do. Here's why. And here's where I need your support. When you get to that point in your journey, in your career field, and your career path, and your current position, my challenge for you is you would become very comfortable. comfortable you become very adamant and you become very concise in what you are doing. So my challenge for you is take that next step and move on to the next piece of what you're trying to do, because you have definitely grown and blossomed into that position that you're in right now. If you're willing to challenge anybody and everyone and figure out what you need to do when you bring those ideas up to senior management. So when you go into work on Monday morning or you log on to Microsoft Teams or you log into Zooms or whatever you log into, my challenge to you is you share that idea with that person above you and you, 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 you press that idea. And if somebody says you're going to have something today or you're going to have something tomorrow, you do what you need to do to make sure that that happens and you get that idea across the finish line. Because for those of you that, 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 that do not know, the worst idea that is out there is the only idea that is never shared. Do not create your own barriers. Please do not do that. And with that, I would like to open it up for questions.
Okay, let me get myself unmuted. So far, we have just one question, and actually it came up earlier in the presentation. It had to do with, um, from Godfrey, he said, do I quit my job if top leadership or the C-suite management refuses to be on the same page of VMP with me because of the bucks? So, Godfrey, thank you for your question. Thank you for chiming in today. For those of you who do not know, uh, Godfrey is working on his dissertation and uh, can definitely share a lot of wealth of knowledge uh, in reference to cyber attacks and uh, compromising information and uh, ransomware attacks and compromising Bitcoin there. So if you don't know Godfrey, uh, I, I challenge you to reach out to him uh, and, and ask him about what he is researching right now. So uh, I, I wouldn't I, I would say that if you have exhausted all of your resources and you have are not getting favorable responses and your organization is not willing to pivot their culture, um, I, I would say it is probably time to move on because that you, you care more about what happens to that organization than they do. And that is not a fair place to be for you. Uh, with that being said, um, I would highly encourage you to find another job before quitting your job. Because uh, what you don't want to do is not have a job and you would have to pay bills and not be able to pay bills. All right, thank you. Uh, I'm not sure I completely understand Timothy's question. I'm going to uh, uh, read it and then um, uh, we'll see how we go with it. What do you need to know uh, to, what do need to know have to do with vulnerab vulnerability management and why? Um, I'm not sure what that question is asking. So maybe Timothy, if you could uh, clarify what what you do, but uh, it, my take on this would be uh, not to answer the question, but interpret the question. Would be uh, what is the core that everybody, whether you're in a management position or not, what's the core level of interest you have to have in vulnerability to for the organization to su succeed. Uh, Timothy, thank you for your question. Uh, I'm going to answer Timothy's question two different ways. Uh, the first piece I'm going to address uh, is the way that was framed up was, you know, what do you need to know for vulnerability management to be successful? Uh, as an end user on a, at a baseline level, you have to have an understanding that no one is susceptible and you could be anywhere and somebody could be trying to hack you, whether it's through your phone or whether it's from your network. Uh, you know, there's applications out there, for example, um, there's a lot, Robinhood out there was popular with uh, the, our, our younger populations uh, for investing in stocks. Robinhood was hacked and a lot of people lost a lot of money on that. Uh, so it, uh, be, just be familiar that it could happen to you and it can happen to you. And if you are not careful, it will happen to you. Uh, now, in reference to need to know, uh, we discussed need to know a little bit. I'm going to go out on a limb that you're talking about need to know of information and vulnerability management. So that's where we would get into our defense in depth portfolio, uh, where we could have different uh, mechanisms for ensuring the confidentiality, integrity, and availability of information. Uh, what you would essentially want to do is assess the level of risk, as we discussed, of what risk are you willing to accept? Uh, find out what, how much security you want to have in place and decide what the value of that information is. Determine you know, how much security you want to put in place and find out what your return on security investment is, uh, plus the impact of, of what would happen if that information is compromised. So when, when I think of need to know, uh, I think of uh, different types of information that are out there. So what you would, the question that I would challenge you with, Timothy, Timothy is what exactly is, what is what you need to know as to do with vulnerability management. So need to know is when, okay, thank you for your clarification on that. So that's where you get into co the confidentiality piece. So if you don't have the need to know uh, and, and you have open ports, you, you don't have the right mechanisms in place, you have a vulnerability. So for example, uh, there, there's a lot, there are systems out there that require multi-factor authentication. Uh, that is because systems that don't, do not have multi-factor authentication or have been known to be susceptible to compromise. Uh, there's a high level of risk there. So if you have the need, to, if you do not have the need to know and you have vulnerabilities, 
you need to have a remediation plan or a mitigation plan to where you can mitigate that risk to an acceptable level uh, of, of, of your organization. Uh, Timothy, did I clarify, answer your question appropriately? While we're waiting for Timothy to respond to that, I see a question from uh, Wilson that is very similar to the God, uh, question that Godfrey asked, but a but slightly different version of it. How do you handle management that they want to see progress, but they don't want to actually support you to make a difference? So I would venture to say that there is a breakdown in communication somewhere on that, Godfrey. Uh, there is the... They want to support, but they don't, they don't, if I understand you correctly, they, they want to make a difference, but they do not. Um, so it's a matter of spelling it out for them, essentially, what I like to refer to as putting it in refrigerator letters. Uh, spell it out in a language that they understand. So, for example, uh, we discussed multi-factor authentication. So when you have multi-factor authentication, you know, you have to have that in place. So if they want to implement that, articulate to them, this is what multi-factor authentication does. This is what it looks like. Here's the, here are the programs, here's the software that, that you can use that with. And that's what, that of how you can go about doing that. So spell it out for them of what supporting looks like. Uh, don't assume that they are going to automatically have an idea of what they are, are going to be able to do because we're the subject matter experts or we're overseeing the subject matter experts. So present to them what exactly that supporting the cybersecurity looks like and, and go, go about it that way. Thank you. Brandon asks an interesting question. He says, what are the limits of liability with regard to security and service providers? For example, your home network is attacked and compromised because your ISP is using compromised or outdated security settings. So, I would have that conversation in advance, Brandon, thank you for your question. I would have the conversation in advance uh, because there is a lot of fine print in contracts where they talk about not being susceptible and like, you know, what, what you do, we monitor it. We're not responsible for protecting it. Uh, what you do on your home router is your business. You're responsible for protecting your SSID. Um, so the, what we can essentially do is have that conversation with our ISP and pay attention to what we're reading in that contract and, and, and go from there. Uh, because a lot of times if, if your systems get compromised, say uh, via ransomware uh, and you call your ISP, they're going to put the onus on you and say, well, why did you click on that? Or how did you, you know, how did you go about that? Uh, why didn't you update your passwords and, and the like? Thank you. Um, Yes, th there are a couple of uh, questions that uh, are kind of somewhat related. Uh, I'm going to mention Timothy's first, but also Larry's at the same time. Um, not everyone should kn should know based on security level and how do we make sure that we're communicating to those that do not need to know. And Larry asks a similar question in the sense that how does your organization handle user training, which comes to bear? In other words, um, when you're training people, how do you make sure that those who need to know certain things have that ability to know it and those who should not know it don't know it? Uh, and and uh, um, I'm curious about that myself, to how that would be handled. So you, you can have segmented networks and you can have access control lists to, within those segmented networks. Uh, and again, I would, I would go back to... Uh, from a, from, from, from a logical standpoint, you can implement access control lists uh, you, you, depending upon which type of information you're trying to access on a logical side. Uh, if you're talking about uh, folders and, and, and the like, you can have security groups. Uh, you can have, um, have multi-factor authentication in place for accessing certain systems. Um, it depends on which way of need to know that you're looking into. So for example, Let's take this Zoom presentation right now. There is the potential to have multiple Zoom presentations going on at the same time. However, in order to get into the Zoom presentation, the potential exists that there could be a passcode on here for entering the Zoom presentation. So that would be a mechanism for access control. Uh, of the 40 people that are on here right now, uh, that, would, uh, that would state that they received access to, the, those, four, to those 40 people have that password. The same can be said for your file structure within an organization. 
you can have an access control list implemented uh, for that information. Now, furthermore, you could also have di different, different virtual local area networks uh, where you can have, to have segmented network, a segmented network structure to where different people have access to different pieces of, of your, your file structure within your organization. So, for example, right now, if we look at our Zoom, there are three people that have presenter rights right now. Everyone else is considered an attendee. That's a mechanism used for need to know. So there are 37 people on here that don't have the need to have presenter rights. Um, in, in reference to user training, uh, my organization, we have a baseline for, out the, for the regular user. We have a generic, not generic, but we have a level of annual training that is required for d distinguishing the uh, best practices, what, what do the do's and don'ts, um, and that is required upon onboarding. And finally, it is, re it is required annually as an annual refresher training. But with that being said, we also can continue, we send out monthly bulletins, we, when something comes up, uh, if there's a potential of things getting compromised with at, with at home, we focus on at home as well. Uh, we focus on different types of security and uh, hot, trends that, hot trends that are going on within cybersecurity. Okay, I do not see any additional questions. I'm going to go ahead and move on to my uh, concluding section, but I'm going to continue to also monitor the questions. So if more questions come in while I'm talking, we'll revert back to you, Dr. Beatty. Now Thank let me you. turn my video on and I will take control momentarily. I wanted to just mention that we have uh, several webinars still coming before the holidays or before Christmas. Uh, we have um, two series of webinars running right now. One is the CapTech talks that we're in. I'll talk about that in a second. But we also have the Impact of Emerging, Emerging Technology on Society series. And our final webinar in that four-part series is on Tuesday, Construction State Safety Advancements, Protecting Workers Through Technology and Innovation. I don't know if many people realize this, but out of the 10 most dangerous jobs in the United States, three of those have to do with construction. And protecting our construction workers, which is one of the big, huge industries in America, uh, encompassing millions of people, uh, is very important. And our chair of safety, Dr. Linda Martin, who I know Dr. Ben, uh, uh, Beatty knows well, uh, will be conducting uh, this webinar and that's on Tuesday, November 24th. Uh, if you'd like to learn more about that, please go to um, the website and check it out. And then we have uh, two upcoming webinars, one in before Christmas and one right after Christmas uh, in the CapTech talk series. Uh, Dr. Brad Sims, the president of Capital Technology University, will be presenting a brand new degree, an online Bachelor of Science program in professional trades administration. This will allow people who've gone through an apprenticeship to actually leverage that apprenticeship hours into college credits to help them work toward a degree. Uh, and then on January 15th, the chairman of our board, uh, Mr. Hayden Land, will uh, present a fascinating talk on the future of technology as it impacts education. I think you'll enjoy both of those. And again, to learn more about them, go back to the webinar webpage, uh, webinar hyphen series. Now, let me just talk real briefly and then we're gonna come back to this final question that I see here from Duane. Uh, we're going to be sending a link to the recording and slides that will either happen later this evening or first thing in the morning. Uh, watch for that email. We'll also at that time give you the opportunity to obtain a certificate of completion. All of our webinars in the CapTech Talk series offer certificates of completion for 60 minutes and you can request one by simply replying to that email with the name that you want on the certificate. And by the way, that if you are watching this on demand, which many people will do, uh, you are also entitled to receive a certificate if you wish. Okay, that concludes my part of the webinar. Just be watching for that email. I'm gonna return now to the final question that Dwayne has, and then we will be concluded for the morning, or for the webinar, excuse me. Dwayne says, is there such a thing as too much security information to the point where employees stop being alert? And how do I avoid this? And furthermore, he asks, what we can do, what can we do as CIOs to keep the information from being disseminated, being disseminated 
stay fresh and relevant? Dwayne, thank you for your question. So there is a point of saturation uh, where we eventually people become numb to information. Uh, it's you know like you refer to it as information fatigue or security fatigue. Uh, if you know the first time you hear about something, it's it is like wow, this is crazy. If you hear about it every day, it it, it manages to diminish. Uh, what I share with my teams uh, is to is to pick your spot like. Everything does not have to be addressed right now. So, for example, if you if your organization, you know, if there is a weekly bulletin that comes out, then, you know, send that weekly bulletin. Don't don't send out something five days a week. If it's a monthly bulletin, send something out once a month. So it's important to establish the operations tempo on how often people are going to be updated and they're going to update their information in reference to security. Uh, it's one of those areas that if people hear about it too often, they're not going to care about it. Uh, if they don't hear about it, uh, if, if they only hear about it when, when something big happens, you got the potential of something small getting through. But picking your spots to where people can expect, expect to hear something, uh, that, 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 that's where the, that's where the, uh, the X, Y axis crosses. Uh, additionally, if, you, if, if there, it does get to a point of saturation, uh, get that senior, get that senior executive management uh, in there to have them send something out about it to get, to get some wheels on it. So, for example, if uh, let's go back to remediation, uh, it 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 um you know you get the remediation strategy and people aren't remediating, th that's because they're getting emailed so often about it that they're no longer reading the, the correspondence about it. So, only sending out communications when it is absolutely necessary. Uh, it, it, it is the way I would go about that. Okay, I had muted myself, so I had to pull myself off mute. Okay, well, thank you very much. I see no further questions. I do want to just, uh, as we conclude, and this will be the last comment uh, of the evening, doesn't really require a uh, response. I was fascinated, uh, Dr. Beatty, by your comment, are you your own barrier and that we have our own self-imposed barriers? And I was thinking about that not so much in a security or IT framework, but just simply with good ideas that exist out there uh, that people uh, do lay awake at night. They, they, Why does no one listen to me? Why will they not? Now, if they try and no one will listen, that's another matter. But many times uh, we don't try. I, I valued that remark and it's something I'm going to ponder to make sure that in the organizations that I'm involved with, whether uh, they're uh, community organizations or professionally, that if I have a good idea that I'm willing to share it and uh, I do like the idea that that you also have an implementation strategy that goes along with an idea. It's not just simply a raw idea, but you know how to fix the problem and you've thought it through in its entirety. But speaking of that entirety, in its entirety, the webinar is now concluded. We will officially stop at this time. The recording will stop. I'd like to thank you again. And as it says on the slide, I would like to remind everyone, if you've registered, uh, I'm going to be sending you, whether you viewed the live session or you're you're going to watch it on demand, I will send you uh, an email with the link to the recording and how to get the participation certificate. And I look forward to hearing from you. And I would also like to mention that if at that point, if you have a question that popped later after the webinar was over, if you s reply to my email, I'll make sure that our presenter gets that and responds directly to you. I'd like to thank everyone. I particularly like to thank Dr. Beatty for this uh, marvelous job today. And uh, you all have a great afternoon and be safe and be secure and uh, follow the advice that he's just presented. Thank you so much and uh, you all have a great afternoon.